to have visionaries. You know, you have to have people that will think outside of the norm. We have to be given the power to tell our own stories. We all want to say our piece. This is a crazy time. What they care about is what it means to them. You have to not think like society thinks. This is a fight about power. Who has it and who has the right to use it? We're having a reckoning about what public safety can, should, and must look like. It's about a broader question of representation and who gets to create the images and define how we see the world. They want their voice to be heard. They have to get involved. Finally, we get to tell our truth and tell our stories like our stories matter. What's going to bring people together is equality. The love that we have for each other is the shortcut to true human happiness. You start to see how it's all connected. Every single person around the world can create a movement. Please welcome back to the stage The Atlantic's Candace Montgomery. Welcome back to our final session of the event. I truly hope that you've enjoyed learning and exploring how to do the work to construct a life that feels full and meaningful over the course of this experience. For our final session, we'll explore how to connect all the learnings from this event to enrich our lives and the lives of those in our inner circles. Enjoy. For our final conversation exploring the secret to happiness, please welcome back to the stage Arthur C. Brooks, contributing writer for The Atlantic. Thank you so very much. I hope you've enjoyed the last day and a half. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope that this has brought a lot of ideas to you that you can now, of course, use in the coming days and weeks and years of your life. I hope this is just the beginning of your happiness journey. I have a few minutes that I want to use right now to, to bring the ideas back together again that we've been talking about, to review some of the key issues, and to, to answer one big question, which is this. If you're going to remember one thing, what should it be? See, we've talked about a hundred different things. You say, well, remember all those hundred things. It's an unreasonable request of you in your journey for happiness. What's the one big thing? What is effectively the most important thing for happiness? And the answer to this question is actually, believe it or not, a public policy question. I used to run this think tank in DC, the American Enterprise Institute. Some of you know that already. And we did a lot of work in, in, in national defense. And over the course of doing this work, I, I saw this story that really caught my eye in sort of the history of defense policy, which was this. I had worked for years at a place called the Rand Corporation, and that's where I got my PhD, and, and I was doing work on military operations research analysis. It's one of the most famous think tanks doing defense work, especially during the Vietnam War. In 1969, soon after Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States, one of the questions that he had as you know, the, the chief executive, but also in an incoming administration, he had to deal with his biggest problem, which was the failing war in Vietnam. He asked everybody around him, why are we losing the war? And there was no compelling reason. The most powerful army in the world was effectively losing. So he impaneled a group of experts to go to Vietnam and find out the answer to this question. This is in early in 1969 after his inauguration. Also involved in this was the Rand Corporation, the think tank, which had a Saigon office at the time. Now, after a month of work, a report was written to explain this mystery. And they came back and briefed the President of the United States, and there was lots of reasons. You know, there was not very much support at home, and there was bad morale, etc. But the biggest reason they came back that was a true shock was that one-fifth of active duty military uh, American troops in Vietnam was addicted to heroin. One-fifth. 20%. Addicted to heroin, the most addictive substance known to mankind. Now, you can't win a war when one-fifth of your troops are addicted to heroin, obviously. And so they came up with a plan on how to deal with this, you know, drug interdiction, et cetera, and public health. But the real worry was what's going to happen when they all come home. Tens of thousands of heroin addicts come home. What's going to happen to communities? What's going to happen to drug policy, policing, public health, etc.? They braced themselves. They put together a, something like a 60-point plan. And the men came home, and nothing happened. 
It was a, one of the greatest mysteries in drug abuse history. <laughs> Nothing happened. 90% of the drug addicted troops stopped using spontaneously on their first day back. And only 5% became re-addicted subsequently. Nothing like this had ever been seen. Now, it's weird when you think about it. Maybe some of you have ever asked a heroin addict, and it seems like a prurient question. What does it feel like? What does heroin feel like? And the answer that they will often give you, I've asked this question. I was a musician for a long time. I've met people addicted to drugs. What does it feel like? They always say, it feels like love. So what happened when they came home from Vietnam? They got love, is the answer. They were reunited with their families, with their parents, with their children, with their wives, with their girlfriends, with their friends. And it seemed, or so it seemed to public health officials, that they didn't need the artificial version. Now, that mystery was definitively solved neurophysiologically in the subsequent years with the discovery and research on this, which I talked about a little bit last night in my conversation with Jeff Goldberg. Oxytocin, which is the neuropeptide that functions as a hormone in the human brain, produced endogenously in response to two things, eye contact and touch. It is intensely pleasurable. It is the gift of bonds with other people. When do you get it the most, by the way? There's this, a lot of research that shows that you can have an explosion of this when you first lay eyes on your newborn infant. So those of you who have children, you remember that? <laughs> I was studying oxytocin when I was working on my PhD, and my wife was very pregnant. And I remember thinking, well, now I know about it. I'm not going to get it. <clears throat> and, and they... they <laughs> And she went into labor, and we were at Santa Monica Hospital. And, and, and I remember thinking, I wonder, I wonder if I'm going to get it. And they, they let me help, right, which is, of course, not true. What they're doing is they're, they're telling you that you're helping, but trying to keep you so if you faint, you don't fall on her. And, <laughs> and as soon as he was born, they put him in my arms. And he looked up at me with his little eyes. And it was like 4th of July inside my head. I got it. And then I had a second child, my son Carlos, I talked about him yesterday. And then, and then, it's same thing. And then we adopted our third. This is a natural, this is a social scientist experiment. Am I going to get it again? And I went by myself to China, to an orphanage to pick up my daughter. And I thought, and she was two years old, maybe it won't be the same. And they put her in my arms, and she grabbed my shirt with her little fists, and <laughs> it's the same thing. This is such an incredible miracle. This is how we're made. We are literally wired for love. This is the most important thing. There's a wonderful experiment at my university called the Harvard Study of Adult Development that has followed a group of men originally, but then their spouses and their children, and it expanded to bigger groups of people, so it's demographically representative, over 84 years, and it asks, what do you need to pay attention to so that you can be old and happy and well? Kind of what I was talking about yesterday. And the guy who ran the experiment, who ran the study, George Valiant at the Harvard Medical School, for 30 years was asked this. And he said, I can tell you the secret to happiness in five words. Happiness is love, full stop. My mentor was a man named James Q. Wilson, the greatest political scientist of the past 25 years, 75 years. And after I finished my PhD in public policy, he said, don't forget that public policy only ever affects people at the 5% margin of life. And I said, you could have told me that before I started a PhD in this, Jim. <laughs> I said, what's the other 95%? And he said, mostly just love. This is your big takeaway. I want to go through some of the things that we've learned over the past day about love that I want you to remember. But the first lesson is just this. Your time is short. Focus on what matters. How much of your life, how much of your energy, how much of your affection are you spending focused not on love? Now, let's break it down a little bit. And let's go back to yesterday when we talked to the Surgeon General of the United States. He was on my podcast. <clears throat> and, and I asked him a simple question. I said, Vivek, What's the biggest problem for public health in America? He didn't say the coronavirus epidemic. Weird, right? He, and this, this is, 
He knows that's a problem. <laughs> he didn't say gun violence. He didn't say opioids. He says loneliness. Why is he saying that? Because of what he told you yesterday and what he's told me many times and what the data manifestly showed to be true. Depression, anxiety are rising at alarming rates, especially among young people. 53% of people under 30 confess, no one knows me well. Hmm. Think about that. And think about how that has changed over our lifetimes. Why is this happening? We've had conversations over the past 24 hours and more about the role of social media, about the role of tech, about the role of screens, but, but there's something more to this malaise. What are we doing here for the people under our stewardship, for the people in our care? What are we doing to lift people up? Now, what's really brought this into stark relief, the fact that we have all this interest about the science of happiness has to do with the fact that we went from malaise to crisis during the coronavirus epidemic. I've never seen a dip in net happiness levels like I've ever seen during the coronavirus epidemic because people became intensely lonely. The isolation, now, now by the way, 9% of the population got happier. They're introverts, like extreme introverts. They're like, they're like, see, here's the deal. We have a society that there's, there's, there's dogs and there's cats. The dogs are the extroverts. The cats are the introverts. We're a dog-based society. But we became cat world during the coronavirus epidemic. And the cats are like, this is awesome. You know, it's like, let's just keep it like this. <laughs> For most of us, it was pretty bad. You know, for people who are not used to having a smaller group of associates, they were crammed together in a tiny little cage. 2020 was sort of the, 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 the divorce lawyer's full employment act was the coronavirus epidemic because we see people actually being torn apart. But beyond that, we see an increase in loneliness like we've never seen before. And beware, you might be lonelier than you think. Loneliness is a funny thing. It's like a, it's like kudzu that's creeping up around you. And you don't know it's a problem until it's too late. 60% of people early in the coronavirus epidemic said that they wanted to quit their jobs because they were so lonely. And by the end, 60% said they didn't want to go back to work. Why? And the answer is because they had become accustomed to a lifestyle where their happiness was lower, but they didn't see it. This is a mental health crisis that's rolling across our country. It's coming toward us. Ask yourself, what are you doing about it? What are you doing to take care of yourself? What are you doing to take care of others? Now, I specialize in dealing with, as you saw yesterday, strivers, people who are working truly hard in their life. I work a lot with CEOs and politicians, and these are some of the loneliest people I've ever met. Now, this is, Vivek Murthy talks about this, but, but we all know this to be true, and some of you know this in your own lives. The, traditionally, the loneliest people in America were 60-year-old men who were above average in income. <laughs> Why is this? Because they've lost their friendship chops. They're surrounded by people all day, but they don't have deep connections. That phenomenon is no longer 60-year-old men. It's spreading to the rest of the population because we're, we're democratizing in our bad happiness hygiene, <laughs> I dare say. Harvard Business Review the publication associated with my academic institution says, has said, a very famous article, leadership is necessarily isolating in that it separates leaders from others. Are you lonely? Are you lonelier than you, than you let on? Well, we've talked about the answer to this, which is real friendship. This is my second big point, which is the most important thing for you to remember about loneliness as you go forward is to ask yourself the following. Do you have deal friends or real friends? What are real friends? They're useless. And not worthless. They're useless. Are all of your friendships just a little bit too useful? Are they a little bit too helpful to your work, a little bit too helpful to your career? How many people surround you who are just useless to you? Is there somebody where you could say, you're useless to me, and that's why I love you. <laughs> that's second. Now let's get into the third area. The third area is romantic love. Now, I'm a romantic by nature. Let me read to you my favorite sonnet. As a young man, this is what motivated me. This is what inspired me. I had this theory. 
romantic love is the secret to all my problems. It's also this, the secret to more and more problems, but <laughs> this is Sonnet 29 from 1609 from William Shakespeare. This could have been from a neuroscientist studying oxytocin. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least. Yet, in these thoughts, myself almost despising, happily, I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my fate with kings. You need romantic love. That's his point. It's the solution. It is the source of so many problems, but the solution, isn't it? You know, it's such a funny thing when we think about how romantic love has affected most of our lives. In a way, it's the scariest and most entrepreneurial thing that we do. Literally, the most entrepreneurial thing I've ever done is to risk everything for love. When I was a 24-year-old, recently turned 24-year-old man, I was a classical musician, and I was barely making rent, but I was on a tour in the Burgundy region of France, and I was very jet-lagged, playing a concert on a little stage with a little audience. Most of my audiences were pretty small. And, and I remember I was looking out at the lights I couldn't quite see, and there was somebody sitting in the front row who was smiling at me, the most beautiful woman, it seemed to me, I'd ever seen. And I thought, she's smiling at me, which didn't happen all that often. And so afterward, I thought, I'm going to talk to her. And I did, and I realized very quickly that she spoke zero words of English. <laughs> so I got a translator and found that she wasn't even French. She was Spanish. And I asked her out on a date, which is what you do at 24, despite a complete lack of any language ability whatsoever. <laughs> and at the end of that week, meeting this woman who spoke no words of English, I no words of any language that she knew, I went home and I called my father, who was living in New York City at the time, I said, Dad, I think I met the girl I'm going to marry. And he said, great, let's meet her. And I said, well, i got some problems. <laughs> number one is she speaks no English. Number two, she doesn't live in the United States. And number three is that she has no idea we're going to get married. He said, well, son, you need a plan. So I hatched a plan. I quit my job. I found a job in the Barcelona Symphony, and I moved to Spain. And my entrepreneurial scheme was to create a startup with my life based on romantic love. Crazy, right? Except most of you have a story like that, too, if you're anything like my age. Now, the music career didn't last, but we just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. And we have three adult kids. <laughs> We've suffered through teenagers together. <laughs> this, my point, is that that's scary, and that's risky, and that's the life in life, isn't it? And that's exactly what we're not seeing today. Let me tell you what I look at when I look at the data as a social scientist. I don't like what I see. Look, I always see little tiny changes between generations in particular activity. I see a 30 percentage point drop in dating among late teens and people in their 20s today compared to when I was that age. You want to know why people are so grouchy on campuses? <laughs> you fill in the blanks. There's less marriage, less cohabitation, less sex. There's a third less likelihood, lower likelihood of saying, I'm in love than there was in the 1980s when I was in my 20s. So, What's the solution? The solution is that people need to stop talking so much about startup companies and start talking more about startup relationships. This is the advice I give my students. They're Harvard Business School students. They understand entrepreneurship. But I say this a lot. Years ago, 
not that long ago. When, before, before I left Washington, D.C., I was talking to a large group of, of, of 20-something staffers in Washington, D.C., a uh, big group, 70 or 80 of 20-something staffers. Now, Washington, D.C. is the world's most dysfunctional dating market. It's terrible because everybody's so ambitious and, and is so many problems and so many dimensions. And I said this, look, y you can say you're an entrepreneurial person, but until you put your heart at risk, until you're willing to have your heart broken, you're not an entrepreneur. That was clever. Two weeks later, I'm on an airplane. Guy comes up to me, he says, you Dr. Brooks? I said, yeah. He said, I heard you give that speech for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff. And uh, I can't get it out of my head. I said, okay. He said, I want to be a startup entrepreneur with my heart. So I'm on my way to Philadelphia right now to declare my love for a woman I've been secretly in love with for two years and she doesn't know. And I said, it's only a speech, man. <laughs> Ugh, I don't want to ruin your life. You know, I said a little prayer for him. <laughs> I gave him my email. I said, tell me how it turns out. You know, it's interesting to me at least. And I never heard from him which is bad. But I saw him several months later at a holiday party. And I went running up to him and I said, remember me? He said, oh yeah. <laughs> I said, so how'd it turn out? And he said, she shot me down with complete prejudice. She introduced me to her, the, woman, the man that she was in love with. And I said, I'm, I was very contrite. I said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you or give you bad advice. He said, no, 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 I've been meaning to call you. I said, I bet you have. He said, I've been meaning to call you to thank you. I said, why? He said, because that was the thing I was literally most afraid of. And it happened, and I didn't die. <laughs> and he said, someday, I'm going to marry somebody I'm in love with, and I'm not going to wonder if it could have been her, because I closed that door, and I know. See, see this, is, this is how entrepreneurship works. You need to take a risk in your life. Your life is your startup. This is how we have to think about what life means to us. Why don't we do it? Because we're afraid. It's so funny that my students are less afraid of putting $10 million at risk than they are of having somebody hurt them in their love life. We need more. We need to encourage this more. We need to model this more. And we need to do this more, by the way. Most of you are not in the situation. I mean, if, if, by the way, if you're already married, I'm not encouraging you to you know, take a risk with your heart because it's a family conference. But, but there's somebody in your life who needs to know that you love him or her. And you're afraid to say it. I know it's true. <laughs> Why are you afraid? You're afraid because you might be rejected, right? So be an entrepreneur with your heart. Are you taking enough risk? Are you ready to tell somebody that you love them and maybe be rejected or maybe be hurt? You want to be happy? Be an entrepreneur. Before I finish, I have a few minutes left. I want to close it on something that Jeff and I were talking about last night. This is not a political conference, thank God. This is a safe space from all the unpleasant nonsense that's going on in, in politics around us. Now, I know that you have opinions, and so do I, but you get to talk about more fundamental things when you're talking about, when you're talking about happiness. But there's a way that we can connect these things, all of us, notwithstanding our opinions. I've mentioned a bunch of times that valuable, beautiful relationship I have with my teacher, my mentor, my beloved friend, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And there was one time, whenever I see him, by the way, this is how we greet, and um, he always makes the same joke, you and I, we have the same barber. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you're 86, you know? And, and I asked him, because I was thinking about this on, on one of these occasions, you know, because I was in D.C., and it was trouble, and we're all anxious about what's happening in our country, about the polarization, about the, the, the hatred that we have. And so I simply asked him, I said, your holiness, what advice do you give me when I'm dealing with people with whom I not only don't see eye to eye, but whom I think are, are deeply misguided? They're wrong. And he said, love them. I said, what are you talking about? Love them. He said, love them. I said, why? Because, he said, because 
you're a Christian? And I said, yes. And he said, your religion, my religion, every religion teaches something about love, that it's a decision. And I remembered something that really moved me a lot. We, we all trade in, you know, the quotes of the wisest people we've ever met. You want to know my favorite quote about politics, which has nothing to do with politics, is from Dr. Martin Luther King. This is from a sermon that he delivered on November 17th, 1957 at the Dexter Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama on, on the Gospel of St. Matthew, the, 40, the fifth chapter, the 44th verse. If you don't know what that is by heart, it's famous. Love your enemies. The most famous and subversive teaching of Jesus is love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And he gave this incredible sermon about love your enemies, which basically is the guidance for all of us now, today, and forever for a country that needs unity, that needs more love. And here's what he said. Love has within it a redemptive power. And there is a power there that eventually transforms individuals. That's why Jesus says love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem and to transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love, is the power of redemption. This is in your hands. The Dalai Lama reminded me that it's your choice to love. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest mind of the medieval period, in 1265 in the Summa Theologica, defined love as to will the good of the other as other. Nothing about feelings. To will the good. He didn't say, Jesus didn't say, like your enemies. As Martin Luther King says, to like is a sentimental something. To love them is to make the decision to love people no matter what your feelings are. So if you want to take the big idea of happiness is that happiness is love. Love is a decision, and it's for everybody with no exceptions. So what are you going to do? What are you going to take from this conference, from this festival, back to your life, where people are throwing political opinions at you nonstop. You can roll your eyes in contempt. You can engage in the hatred. You can feed the outrage industrial complex. Or you can fight it with the power of your love. And in the process, get happier. Love your enemies, notwithstanding your feelings. What relationship do you need to reestablish today? What example do you need to give today? How can you amaze somebody with your subversive ability to love where there's hate? You have this power. You will be happier, and you will be bringing happiness to a country in happiness decline. You can be part of the solution starting today with this idea. So here's your homework, friends. Today and for the rest of your life, Get out of the technocratic zone of mindless detail. Get into the zone of love. Talk about it. Talk about it openly. Cultivate real friendships. I got it. Deal friends. I have deal friends too. But if that's all you have, you're poor. Third, be an entrepreneur. Take a scary risk with your heart. You have one week to tell somebody that you love them. And if it's not scary, it's not entrepreneurial enough. Try again. <laughs> Finally, love your enemies. <laughs> By the way, I asked the Dalai Lama. I said, are you saying that, because one time he said that when I love my enemies, I destroy my enemies. And I said, why do you want to destroy people? He says, you don't understand. When I love my enemies, I destroy the illusion that they were my enemies in the first place. You ready for that? You ready for power? You now have power. I deputize you as professors of happiness as demonstrated in your love. If you're ready for that, you're ready for anything that the world is going to throw at you. As you leave this festival, we are a community. We are a movement based on the apostolate of true love for our fellow women and men around the world with no exceptions. I'm not asking you to agree. I'm not asking you to be civil. I'm not asking you to be tolerant. I'm asking you to love everybody. This is actually how we can take all of the ideas package them up neatly, and share them with the world. If you're ready to do that with me, all I can say to you is for what you're about to do for the world as you leave here, as you enter mission territory that does not have enough love, you're doing something that I'm truly proud to be part of. Thank you, and, and by the way, 
I love you. And now for a wellness moment with Arthur C. Brooks. Today's exercise is called turning your job into your mission. Now, it sounds pretty bold, doesn't it? There's the old story about somebody who's walking down the street and he, he sees somebody who's putting one brick on top of another. And he asks him, so what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, obviously, I'm just laying bricks. There's a guy next to him doing the same thing. And so he says to him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm building a wall. There's a third guy doing the same thing, and he says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a cathedral. So what's your answer? Are you laying bricks? Are you building a cathedral? If you want your job to be a mission, you need to do two things. The two things that take a job and make it into a mission, that make it truly meaningful, are earning your success and serving others. Earning your success is the opposite of what the great social psychologist Martin Seligman calls learning your helplessness. In his research, he's found that learned helplessness occurs when people feel like they don't have any control, that no matter what they do doesn't really affect the outcome. It's actually really clear in the research that it's correlated with depression and anxiety. The opposite of learned helplessness, where you you just feel helpless. You're not, you're not gonna do anything. You're not gonna put any special effort forward. You're certainly not gonna like what you're doing. The opposite is earned success, where you're creating value with your work. To do that, you need a feeling of accomplishment and a path forward. So ask yourself this in your work. What am I doing, what am I accomplishing, and what is my path forward? Now, I realize that this can be hard to do depending on your job. For example, let's just say you're you're an insurance agent. It's easy to be thinking, well, I'm trying to sell people insurance and they don't necessarily want it. I feel like I'm trying to get people to eat their Brussels sprouts because it's a, a responsible thing to do. I, I guess that's helping them, but on a lot of days, you probably feel like you're an annoyance. Well, let's think a little bit deeper. I've done a lot of research on that very industry. Insurance is truly a happiness engine for people because it takes uncertainty and takes fear out of people's lives. Go forward every single day saying, I'm going to remove fear from somebody's life today so that that person can feel free to earn their success and so that they can, without fear, serve other people. That's a beautiful thing to do. And you can do that. And you can find that kind of link in any job that you have that's honest and that, in point of fact, is serving your values. If you think where what you're doing is leading you and how it's creating value and how the value you're going to create is going to build on the value you're currently creating, you'll be building a cathedral. That's earning your success. Write it down, make a plan, see what it looks like over the next 10 or 15 years. The second is that your job can't be about you primarily, not even <laughs> that often. You need to serve other people. Think to yourself, who am I serving? I know it can be circuitous. I know it can be hard. I know it can be hard to imagine who it might possibly be. And on some days, it's really, really frustrating. But in some way, shape, or form, something that you're doing should be able, in your mind, to get to somebody who needs you, somebody with less power than you, somebody who will benefit, maybe benefit greatly from your work. Think of that person. Dedicate your work to that person and watch your satisfaction grow. Please welcome back to the stage, The Atlantic's Candace Montgomery. Wow, what an incredible time we've had together. 
Thank you to Arthur Brooks, all of our speakers, and everyone at The Atlantic that contributed to this enlightening and thought-provoking experience. And thanks to all of you for joining us these past few days. Also, we want to thank our underwriters, the John Templeton Foundation and Tito's Handmade Vodka for supporting The Atlantic's journalism. We hope you learned insightful and practical tips to help you on your journey to building a more meaningful life. We have one parting ask of you, to share your participant feedback on this experience and what you'd want from future Atlantic events. We're sending a two-minute digital survey to your email today and request that you share your reactions, which our team really pays attention to when designing these events. Thank you again for being part of this program. Thank you.